This is the Escape the GIF podcast, and I'm Dr. Jacob Egbert. Today's topic, root cause. Why root cause and what is root cause? So the root cause in any situation is essentially the origin of the outcome. And that's a term that I use often in my programs. My meditation course is titled the Uto Method, O-O-T-O, Origin of the Outcome. Essentially what it does is it goes to the root cause of any, of any outcome that it is that you experience in your life. Or you create the root cause of a future outcome that you choose or design. So the term root cause is often used in solving problems. So let's say engineering, for example. A mechanical problem goes wrong, and the objective of the engineers and those that are there to solve the problem is to find the root cause. And oftentimes the root cause is not the immediate problem or the problem exactly where the presentation is. So we use this in medicine all the time. Now, an example of this would be a person comes in, they have high blood glucose levels, they're peeing a lot, they're very thirsty, they're hungry all the time. And of course, the diagnosis with certain testing would reveal diabetes. Let's say they're adult, it's going to be type 2 diabetes. And you can say, okay, well, the cause of diabetes here is that your muscles are insensitive to insulin and and they're not taking in enough glucose. Your blood glucose levels are high and therefore there's a diagnosis. Okay, so is the cause that the muscles don't respond to insulin or is the cause 12 to 15 years of excessive carbohydrate intake and decreased exercise, which would lead to an eventual insensitivity to insulin and an excessive amount of insulin within the blood to combat the elevated blood glucose levels. Okay. Well, sure, you can say the root cause is the diet. Well, let's take that a step further. Why did they make those choices in their dietary or lifestyle habits? What was it that led them to, for the last 12 to 15 years in this scenario, choose those foods and abandon activity or exercise as a part of their daily habit? Well, perhaps they were busy. Their job was such that they didn't feel that they had time to exercise and the available foods were that which led to the excessive carbohydrate intake and elevated blood glucose levels. Okay. The job, that was the root cause. Well, maybe not. Maybe that person went through a divorce and, and now their income was divided and they're paying for an entire household in addition to their current household and the, ch- the charge for them was to increase their output. And therefore, they took a higher paying job, but it was more stressful, etc. Okay, well, maybe the root cause was the divorce. Well, why did they get divorced? And it goes on and on and on. And maybe it comes all the way down to childhood when they felt abandoned when something happened in their, in their youth. Well, maybe that was the root cause. Maybe. Well, what caused the abandonment in that scenario? Perhaps a parent had a poor outcome in in their previous relationships. And the root cause can go on and on forever. But essentially, the point of this is to look further back to really identify what led to the outcome. What was the origin? And is it even identifiable? Or can we at least identify some areas where intervention or alteration in actions can be made? So when we do root cause analysis in medicine, we typically only look back a little ways. So for example, the excessive glucose intake or carbohydrate intake. So we're going to start to counsel this patient. Well, you need, you need to eat better. Okay. You need to exercise. Okay. How often does that little advice from the doctor l- result in this patient, okay, I'm going to go eat better and exercise. Well, rarely, honestly. And those that do, often it doesn't last. Because again, the root cause is greater than 
that action. Something always precedes the action. And likely, in most scenarios, this action is preceded by emotion. It's preceded by a deep-seated belief system. And, as we know, belief systems and emotion and feelings live within the subconscious mind and are not under conscious control. And therefore, a brief conversation in a doctor's office will not result in any meaningful change. That's just reality. Unless that, that physician was able to draw on some deep emotional listening in the subconscious mind of this particular patient. Again, very rare. And a transformative experience is called for. Now, what is a transformative experience? Typically, a transformative experience is one where the person is left with a new view of life, a new view of the way things are in such a way that it shakes them deep within. This new view also, not just consciously, logically, or through their interpretation and judgment, but that view incorporates deep emotional seeing, knowing, feeling, or, or understanding. And once that deeper sense of experience is called up, then a shift can be made. Then we can get to the root cause, which is deep within the subconscious. It's not the habits necessarily. It's not the environment. It's not the actions or the job or the divorce. Those are all contributors to feeling and experience. But deep within the person is a subconscious operating system that when accessed, when able to be shown a different way, and I say shown, not like a visual thing necessarily, like you see something new, but essentially you experience a new way in such a way that you can take new actions automatically. Then transformation occurs and then things can shift. So you won't often hear doctors speak like this because this isn't what we're taught. This is not something that I came to in medical school. And honestly, not for 10 plus years after graduating while searching for this answer deliberately. This is something that I've recently discovered in the last five years. And I'm still pursuing a more clear way of understanding this phenomenon, of understanding how to influence others for their own good. Now, why do I even care? What, who am I to influence others for their good? Is not their good their responsibility? Well, of course it is. But like anything that you receive value from in the society that we live in, someone developed themselves to be highly skilled at that thing that you may need. Now, let's say I'm a surgeon. Your health and well-being is in the hands of a surgeon when you need a surgeon. You get in a car accident, you have a trauma, and you're cut all over, you're bleeding within internally, and you rush to an emergency room. Well, your life is in your hands. It's your responsibility. Not really. Left to your own devices, you will bleed out and die within minutes. Therefore, you call upon a surgeon who has developed themselves to have the skills to answer that one need that you have and you say help and they say I got you because I'm here for this now others you know mechanic that fixes your car I don't know anything about fixing my car I don't have the tools for it therefore when I need my car fixed I go to the expert who has developed themselves to add that value to our society and of course we have an exchange of of means for this, similarly with a surgeon. So the point of all this, you know, just to kind of like get back on track, physicians aren't trained to answer that question, the deeper question of why. I don't think they're trained to because the system, the medical industrial complex, 
doesn't support that type of communication, that type of transformative education. And those people that are involved in it, physicians, don't want to do it for the most part. They're busy honing their skills and craft to do surgery or diagnose diabetes in the moment and create a treatment plan to keep that person functioning now. Now, I've, I've actually, I, I gave a talk on this 10 years ago. And the title was, Your Doctor Knows Very Little About Health. And so that was when I was deep in the inquiry of how do I help people? How do I develop myself to add value to others? And that's still my pursuit in this very specific area. Now, over these last 10 years, I've continued to ask that question until I've come to the current conclusion, which is the root cause is far beyond the behavioral social predictors of health, your lifestyle, et cetera. Those are just symptoms. Those are just the surface level activities. And in order to influence others, it takes more. Now, I'll also say this. I am no longer, and I've said this before in, in different settings, but I'll say it again with a little bit more resolve. I am no longer interested in helping everybody. I'm just not. If I could, awesome. But I know very well that I cannot. Because everybody won't do what it takes. There's a very small fraction of people that will. And those people are the only ones that I want to work with. And that be that is because I have energy conservation as a priority in my own life. I began my career idealistic, as many of us do. And there's a, a perspective with idealism. Idealism is, is it's safe, it's naive, and it doesn't have a lot of real world experience. But it's good intention and it, it definitely is the aim that guides action. So I had these ideals and I began my journey 15 years ago once I graduated med school with the intention of spreading health. And what I knew at the time was physical fitness. And I just knew that that was the answer. And beyond that, I started to study and learn about nutrition. So I'm like, okay, physical fitness and nutrition, that is the answer. I remember my first case study. I had recently discovered CrossFit back in 2007 I just graduated medical school. I'd started my, my residency program. So I had this home gym and I made a squat rack out of two by fours and pipes to make pull up bars and a basketball filled with sand as a medicine ball. And this is before all these things were readily available. Um, so anyway, I have this little home gym and I'm working out and I'm doing these workouts that have names and things. And it's fascinating. It's early in the, CrossFit, for whatever you want to call it, like birth of, of popularity. And so my wife at the time, since divorced, she was outside and she noticed somebody across the street and he, she's like, hey, do you work out? And clearly didn't. And she's like, come over. My husband needs somebody to work out with. So she basically match made and brought him over. So he comes over and he's, he's overweight. He's 27 years old and he's on blood pressure medication, antidepressants and another medication for, or his doctor was talking to him like, I'm about to put you on cholesterol medicine. And so long story short, he came over and he began training with me and I turned him on to paleo diet and CrossFit. And within six months, he went from 210 pounds chubby to 185 shredded, like six pack on six pack on six pack. And one of the workouts that we did, it took him 
14 minutes to complete. And within six months, we dropped him down to four minutes for the same workout. So essentially, his fitness improved dramatically in addition to his physique and his diet and all of these things. So we, we could say that it was diet and exercise that changed his life. And he went back to his doctor and the doctor says, I've never seen anybody change numbers like this. And he took him off all his medications. He was no longer on antidepressants. He was no longer on antihypertensives. And he's like, there's no reason to start a cholesterol medicine because your health is now perfect as per the laboratory workup. Well, those were the tools, but that wasn't what changed this friend of mine. It was connection. It was his heart was touched by somebody inviting him over and wanting to spend time with him in a meaningful way. And he was inspired by what I was up to because I was pursuing this excellence. I was pursuing this endeavor where I was excited about becoming better. And he saw that and he felt it. And we've since had the conversation about this, like, you know, I'm not making this up. He, he literally like shared with me emotionally how much it meant to him that I brought him in. So what's the answer here? What's the root cause of his transformation? What doctor would do that for him other than this one? And I can only do it for so many in that way. But that changed my perspective. And I still didn't see the connection component initially. This took years later to discover, to really get. So I saw that and I thought, okay, it's diet and exercise. And then I began prescribing diet and exercise to my patients when I, when I got out of residency, well, during residency, but especially when I got out and I had my own practice. And I'm like, I owned a gym. I, I bought a CrossFit gym and I actually operated a gym. So I get up at 4.30 in the morning and go train at the gym, teach classes, and then I'd go to work. And then after work, I'd come back and maybe had to have to go back to the gym. And I had a partner that took care of half of the schedule. And essentially, I operated a transformative health clinic. Not really, but essentially a gym where I brought people in and we got them on weight loss programs and we had fun. We had that connection, that community that resulted in legitimate transformation. And I'm like, it's exercise, it's diet. And looking back now, I'm like, it's community, it's connection, it's feelings, it's identity. And those are the components that actually lead to meaningful change or transformation. Okay. So I had this job and I couldn't refer people in my clinic to my gym because there's like conflict of interest there. So I didn't ever do that directly. But most of my patients that come in, they have like back pain or they're, they're you know, other joints are aching and having chronic inflammation. And I would sit down and I'd be like, let me tell you the solution here. It's diet and exercise. And of course, I would do this in a more enrolling fashion. And they would, you know, they'd be like, oh, but it hurts and I want pain medication. And this is in the early, early 2000s. So, well, mid 2010, 2011. And the opioid epidemic was still in like full swing. So people wanted narcotics. And I didn't prescribe narcotics. I was very, very reticent to give out narcotics because I, I just philosophically didn't believe in them. And then... I was essentially a feeder to our neurosurgeon who would do back surgery, spine surgeries. And I remember getting pulled aside once. That they're like, you haven't referred anyone to surgery in like three months. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't do that. I, I try to get him on diet and exercise and I'm not giving him opioids. And they're like, well, pe some people are complaining. And I'm like, well, what? Complaining about what? Like, what's going on? They're like, well... Some people are like, you, you take too long in your visits and you're not giving them pain medications. And the surgeon's like, you're not referring to surgery. 
And long story short, again, they ended my contract. And the reason they gave was literally this, philosophical differences. So essentially I got fired from my first job because I didn't give narcotics and refer to surgery enough. Okay. That's the medical industrial complex for you. So what did I do? I went and got another hospital job. And instead of working in a pain clinic, I went to inpatient rehab where I, I treated patients with strokes and brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. And I actually had a decent time with that. Um, that was a better fit for me philosophically because I was actually adding value. Most of my patients received therapy as a treatment. That was the process. We took them from a lower level of function and through therapeutic and other means, we'd raise them up as high as we could. And I was able to provide inspiration and encouragement. And I ran a team where I was able to do the same with them. So it was, it was awesome. Well, the industrial complex continues to push. And philosophically, I just, I don't fully agree with medicine as it's currently practiced. So I recently found another job and I just started that job a couple weeks ago, actually. And this is a, a pain clinic. Now, as you go back to the beginning of my story, I started in a pain setting. Well, now I'm in another pain setting, but this one is unique in that it's a non-operative, non-narcotic or non medication based pain clinic. And one of the other factors here is that this particular clinic is designed with the idea of at least attempting to identify root cause and look at the lifestyle. And they provide lifestyle and nutrition counseling and they encourage exercise as a philosophy of the organization that I have signed on with. So philosophically, it actually matches my practice quite well. And I bring all of this up for one purpose to get back to the original topic of root cause. Root cause, which I've identified as a number of factors, but largely in the subconscious mind or the heart, the emotional component of being human, that connection base, that part of belonging. There are so many elements that drive a person to want to act differently. So... The other factor that I want to get to today is this. No matter how healthy you are right now, you are on the doorstep of chronic disease. What I mean by that is this. Most of my patients over the last 15 years have been older, 60 plus, 70s, 80s, a few 90s. And these are patients that deal with chronic diseases. Now, chronic disease is that which stays and then you just treat it and it continues. It's not like, in, you know, you get a pneumonia. That's not a chronic disease. That's an acute disease. You get an infection, it knocks you down. Maybe you become septic and you require intervention or you have a fracture or some other thing. Cancer, for example, is not a chronic disease necessarily. It happens, it progresses or it, or it goes away. Chronic diseases are those such as high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, heart disease, emphysema, COPD, asthma, you know, it just goes on and on. All these autoimmune disorders, things that are acquired and don't go away and require treatment ongoing. It's a disease that remains in place, chronic, chronic pain. So... I've been in the company of many of these people. And what I observe is that it's very common. Now, of course, it's, you know, population selects. I only see the sick people or at the worst, but there's a spectrum and I see a lot of people. But a lot of these people, they're older, you know, 70, 75. They come in and they say, I was really healthy. I looked a lot like you when I was your age. I used to be so fit and I could do all these things. And now I have peripheral neuropathy and my feet burn and tingle and keep me up every night. What can I do? I have diabetes and I don't know how I got it. 
I don't eat that bad. My blood pressure has been high for X amount of years. And I finally had a stroke. I can't move half my body. And the stories continue. Because as we get older, the shift to disease or lack of health can happen like that. And a lot of it is preventable. And here's another thing I want to say. The root cause, the whole topic that I want to talk about tonight, has to do with patterns that happened, patterns that are occurring, things that were in place years prior to the outcome or the presentation of disease. And these people who are 75 years old saying, I looked like you when I was your age, 30 years ago. Well, they may have, but they didn't have the habits. They, they hadn't developed the skills to manage their lifestyle. They were naturally kind of like kids. You know, kids are, for the most part, very healthy. Teenagers, 20s, 30s. Maybe it starts to decline a little bit in the 40s, start to put on more weight, and then it just goes downhill from there. Because you can rest on your laurels of youth for so long before the rug gets pulled out from under you. And you've got a disease. You've got diabetes. You've got high blood pressure. You've got all these other things. Now, that root cause, and this is something that I adopted years, actually when I was a teenager, I would say this. I had the insight or the foresight. I was very health conscious even as a youth. I said, I'm going to develop the habits now that will preserve me into my old age. I, for some reason, I had that. And I thought, it's easier to do this now than continue than it will be to change my mind when I'm 50 and start exercising. It's just, I just, for some reason, I saw that. And so I've put myself in position to develop habits. So the root cause, perhaps it was me observing my dad who was health conscious and he had always bring home magazines like muscle and fitness. And he was always into new exercise, this and supplements and his, his cabinets are full of vitamins and other things. So perhaps that's part of my root cause of my health trajectory. Fine. What I want to say here is that these patients that come in, they're living in a generation. And this is, this is a kind of a shift here, but this is a kind of a big point that I want to make for you, the listener today. They're 70, 80 year old now. They had a much different 40 year old environment than we have. When they were 40, this was in the 80s. And their youth leading up to 40 was the 40s and 50s and 60s. Things have changed. The 40 years, the 40 year olds of today are not nearly as fit and healthy as the 40 year olds of the 70s and 80s. From very many, from a number of different markers because the environment was significantly different. In the late 70s, early 80s is when the, the dietary shifts occurred, where the increasing carbohydrates became pushed, when people started saying fat-free, which increased carbohydrates. So we had this enormous shift in the dietary landscape to where now the vast majority of 40-year-olds are overweight. Now, even 30 year olds are overweight. We don't know what the 30 to 40 years from now environment is going to look like. I predict, based on the individuals that I've seen that have not done well, that the vast majority of you, if you're in your 30s and 40s, when you're older, you're all in trouble. You're just all in trouble, like serious trouble. You're caught in the drift. 
because the drift is the environment. The drift is the habits. The drift is society. It's culture. Now I have some outliers out there that are very health conscious like me. And yet I am a few decisions away from poor health. I'm on the doorstep of chronic disease and all I have to do is open it and take a few steps in or forget, not forget, but to just kind of like let things slide for a little while because that snowball effect of habit can lead to calamitous outcome. So this is sort of a warning that we have no idea what our generation in the elder years will look like. Although I have a prediction based on what I've seen and it's not good. The vast majority of you will need hip replacements, knee replacements, peripheral neuropathy treatments, diabetic disease medication management, hypertensives. You'll be having strokes. You'll be having heart attacks. You'll be having debility and dependency at numbers that we have never seen. And it's, it's just going to happen that way because there is no way we're going to shift the entire population. Now, I want to add one last thing to this before I move on. With that decline in large amounts of the population's health, enormous population health decline, comes ridiculous amount of cost. Who's going to bear the burden of that? We're already strapped financially. We're already strapped as a nation in many ways. And to bring on that level of disease... Do the math, do the projections. It's not good. So, word of warning, be healthy. Another word of warning, get your house in order. And when I say be healthy, I mean ridiculously healthy. Like take on full accountability and effort to protect yourself from the environment that is at hand. The toxic, awful environment that is our current surrounding. You have to have intention with everything that you do, nutritionally, activities, exposure, etc. Okay, not to be a downer. Let's shift over. So how this is relevant to the Escape the Drift podcast and the Your Human Experience Endeavor is this. When you've been caught in the drift, let's say, you have the habits, you have the lifestyle that doesn't serve you long term. Perhaps you have experienced some things where you're like, well, the root cause is behind me and the outcome out there is bleak. Okay, that may be you. If so, now is the time for action. Now is the time for freedom. Because when in the drift, you are not free. You're a captive of circumstance. You're a captive of prior decisions. You're a captive of the way things are around you. And in order to be free, you need to be responsible. You have to stop blaming the environment. Stop blaming society. Stop blaming the food industry, the medical industrial complex. And stop and just look at it and and observe it and say, okay, this is the way it is. And this is what I'm going to do. Now, taking it back to the original, like, well, how do you do that? How do you transform? Well, here's the reality. I'm only interested in in dealing with those people that have the capacity and the insight and the drive to do that. I'm not here to save everybody because honestly, most of you, and maybe not you if you're listening to this podcast, you're a more wise or in tune person, but you, the greater you that exists out there, you don't have what it takes. I'm only interested in interacting with people that are ready to be serious about their health and their well-being, that are open to understanding that it is far more than healthy diet and exercise. They understand, or you understand, that there's an internal component of your subconscious, your feelings, your emotion, your beliefs, your values that need a new knowing, a new seeing that will allow you to open up to a new view of life that will allow for 
new actions. That is who I'm looking to work with. And as such, what I'm doing at this point is I'm shifting my, my coaching group offerings, my meditation course offerings into a, a, an exclusive application based entry, so to speak. Like you cannot get into my group without filling out an application and qualifying for that you will do the work or that you have the capacity to do the work because I will not put this in front of the swine, these pearls any longer. If you're not dedicated and capable of making real change, I will not waste my time with you. Now, I don't currently have that luxury in my, my employed position as a, a physician, but in these other areas I do. I have the luxury because I don't need the money. I'm not doing this currently for my livelihood. I'm doing it out of the, the drive within me to elevate the experience of being human. And the only way I can do that is if the human over there says, I need the thing that you offer because I'm already up to something it's similar to me when I, my car is broken. I've got things to do. I need this car to work. I don't have time to be the mechanic. I'm going to bring it to the expert. And so I'm putting myself out there as the expert in this particular area. The reprogramming of the mind, the subconscious, in such a way that is intentional and powerful and creating a new future. If you want to take your life to the next level, like seriously to the next level, and you're like, I've tried things, I've, I've made plans, I've, I've put myself out there, I've like bought the gym membership, I bought the running shoes, I started the diet and none of it worked. And maybe even deep back in the, in the background, you're like, I want my relationship to better, be better, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get over this fear. Or I want to excel in my career. Or I want to find my purpose and you're serious about it. Not just Instagram happy quotes, but like you want it and you're pursuing it. You're like, I need the person that can help me. That is the person I want to work with. And therefore, the application. This is an exclusive offering and I will work with a very small amount of people because I want to make a difference. I will drive into the root cause and together we will excel because also I want to surround myself with these people. I have been very exclusive with who I interact with in my personal life. My friends are all amazing, powerful people, killers in their own right, successful, and I will not interact with anyone less. So, to be free, find the expert. To be free, find the root cause. Open up the deep parts of you, the deep parts of your heart, those things that drive you forward or have held you back. And that is how you move to the next level. That is how you escape the drift. I'm Dr. Jacob Egbert. And this was the root cause escape the drift podcast. <laughs>